Bricano was founded by me in very close friendship with several dear people in 1991. It actually began as just a few friends talking about, well, we think we need, we could form an institute. I'm often reminded of Paul Simon's song, Oh, That's Astute, Let's Get Ourselves Together and Form an Institute. We didn't even feel that smart. We just had a, a deep need at the time without quite knowing why that we should organize in an, into a nonprofit status. And then we were just filled with ideas of what Burkana could be for. And we started by just beginning uh, dialogue circles in the days when that was not very common and creating opportunities for people to learn this brand new paradigm coming from the new sciences that I had just written about. And then in 2000, we went global and we focused specifically on younger leaders because I had been working with a few of them and I realized this was where all the richness and also the challenges were. I've always had my thinking sharpened by working with younger people from many different countries. And gradually, we just created the possibility to be in many different countries. At one time, we were having conversation circles in over 40 countries. And now we're focused on working in with the people who are already in their communities and are organizing. And we support them by creating many opportunities for further learning and exchanges among them globally. The Burkana Institute was founded 15 years ago. And the name Burkana comes from a Norse rune. And it means growth and development. And it's all about paying attention to the new life that's here paying attention to the vitality, the health, the well-being of the community and inviting forth that new life, inviting forth the new ways of leading, the new ways of learning together, and the new ways of organizing ourselves on behalf of life. The reason I got involved with the Burkana Institute is that I have been part of some of the offerings, in particular the Art of Hosting, where they provide training to to facilitators, and I'm a professional facilitator, in how to host community conversations. And so I'm part of the community of Burkana, of host community hosts, and the offer was made to a group of core um, people here in Vancouver, would you help us to put on this fundraising event for Burkana? It helps us to provide um, support to women, especially in developing countries, because wherever women rise, wherever women are involved, it makes a huge difference in the development of communities, in children, in economies. And so I said yes, um, asked a number of my good friends, would they come? And, and that's how it was. The vision of Burkana is the work of many, many people, which is a good thing because it keeps growing rather than narrowing. My own focus within Burkana, but I'm just part of a larger community of people, is to really focus on women's leadership because I see that as such a paramount need worldwide and especially important for us Western women to realize that women everywhere are stepping forward and we may be the more hesitant ones. So that's my particular focus within Burkana, but others are carrying their own issues and causes and working very hard to to make things happen and that's the beauty of being a self-organizing system i not only preach it and write about it but at burkana people really have the opportunity if they have an idea a concern a passion that they can organize and mobilize the resources and then working within the burkana framework make that happen in Cameroon, in uh, right at the border between West and Central Africa. But I've traveled so much that, you know, my home, uh, part of my home is also in, in Paris, and another part of my home is now here in Canada, in Vancouver especially. I feel so connected with people here in Canada. I feel that um, people have really accepted me for who I am and allowed me to share my gifts with people. And it's not something that I felt that I could really do when I was in France. And so when I came here, it just felt like, oh, I'm home again. As much as uh, I feel comfortable here, as much as I feel comfortable back home in Cameroon. What brought me to Vancouver was uh, more of a curiosity, really. But at the same time, I have to add that there was 
uh, an intuition. I couldn't explain what it was, but I had to come to Canada and I had to come to Vancouver. And I just knew that somehow my life was going to really um, take its flight from here. And I came totally out of the blue. I, I, I quit my job in, in France. I was living in Paris before. I quit everything and my friends were, thought that I was nuts. But I just knew, you know, what, I just knew that I had to follow that intuition. And here I was. I, just, I had never been to Vancouver, I, to Canada. I didn't know anyone here. And um, I never regretted it. When I arrived here, that's the first thing that I noticed, how, how well I was welcomed. And that really surprised me because I felt like people were not only willing for, uh, to, uh, to receive what I had to, to say and offer as part of my culture, but they were also asking for it, really literally asking for it. I didn't have to tone down my Africanity anymore the way I had to in Paris. Really, it's a, quite, it was a, quite an interesting shift when I came here. And I felt like now finally I was more free to be myself. And I felt so accepted and so welcome here that I, I, I had, uh, I've always had such a big um, feeling of gratitude towards Canada and towards its people. And really it's the people who make that difference. It's not the country itself. The country itself is made out of people. And the people that I meet every day here when I teach, when I perform and things like that, everybody is always so nice with me. I just love it here. My passion, oh, people. <laughs> I love to dance, I love my culture, I love to share my culture. Dance for me is a, a vehicle to share my culture. I am also a storyteller, so I love telling stories. I love to tell people about my culture, about the people, about the reality of, of who African people are. But also I love to connect people to people. Because what people see in the media, what our leaders are, uh, are portraying, is not really the reality of Africa. And I would love for every person to actually have a chance to connect with Africa on a personal level. And so when I do programs, it's all about community. It's all about bringing the African culture here. One of my big, big passion is really about bringing the gift that Africa has to offer to the world. It doesn't always go just one way. Most people have had the, the experience of thinking for a long time that, that everything goes from the West into Africa or we're going to go and help those poor African people. But they don't realize that we have a lot of things that we can share with the Western world and they can benefit from. And the community, our community spirit is part of that. The wisdom of Africa, of in, what is called indig indigenous cultures, is very important. And because people have uh, gone so far away from it in the Western world, I believe that they even did need it even more, more and more here. And therefore, a culture like Africa has a lot to offer to people because once people are comfortable, they are rich and they're comfortable at home and they live in luxury. Well, if they don't have uh, that uh, sense of togetherness with the, their neighbors, with their family and things like that, what is left? You know, you don't get uh, warmth from um, your um, silver spoon or, or a luxurious environment. You get that from people, being with people and helping each other, singing together, dancing together. In Africa, that's what we do. When we dance together, it's about bringing the community together. It's about telling the person that, oh, you're my friend or you're my sister. We Let's dance together to celebrate life. D that's what it is about. It's not just walking all the time. It's also taking the time to celebrate and enjoy life. So that's one of the things that I believe we can bring as African people here to the West, and that is really definitely my passion. My greatest passion right now is something I've learned from being out in some of the poorest, materially poor communities in the world, places that are really suffering from economic collapse, even if they ever had any advantage. And I've learned from these communities of people what is the source of resiliency and even what is the source of joy which is our relationships and when I come back to the West I often feel that we just don't get it we don't understand how poor we are because we think that we can just love things and not worry about our relationship and we think that if we don't have things we're going to be unhappy so my own work right now is really focused on trying to help people see the need, the necessity, the absolute necessity for community and for relationships where we're really together in this. This is a women's leadership revival tour because so many of us feel exhausted too often. Do, does anyone here feel exhausted ever? No? <laughs> it really crystallized in my own imagination when I was with a group of women, leading a group of women to South Africa. And uh, we were 
women from Australia, England, Canada, and America. And we were meeting at this particular point, we were meeting with formal women leaders, even though for these learning journeys that you'll hear more about in a little while, we, we meet with informal women, young girls. You'll see some photos of South African fisherwomen and such. Here we were, this group of Western women, meeting with South African women who run large foundations, banks, are in the government. And uh, I introduced our group as a group of tired Western women, because <laughs> we were, <laughs> who had come to South Africa to be inspired by all these amazing women. And so the woman who uh, was responsible for the whole event, a wonderful woman named Jill Marcus, who has uh, been in the struggle, in the revolution, in many government positions. She's just an extraordinary woman in South Africa. She stood up and she said, would someone please explain to me what you Western women have to be tired about? <laughs> it's a really good question. When women win, mountains move. When women rise, the world rises with us. So women wait, women wait. you to ask yourself, do you really believe this? Really? Really, really? Because it's very important that we truly believe this as our primary motivation for stepping forward. So what Archbishop Tutu wanted us to recognize, which we do have to recognize, is that the major powers of the world are arming the third world. And we just had a terrible incident between Zimbabwe, China, and South Africa, where South Africa funded, I do not understand this, I never will. Now there's something even darker here, and it's what happens to women in war. And this is something that is changing now between the 20th century from the beginning till the end and to now as well. In World War I, civilians were 5% of the casualties. Now, civilians are 90% of the casualties. And there's something worse here. Rape and scorched earth are weapons of war. And I want to put this a little differently since I made this slide. Women are now the targets of war. They are the objects of war. You just tune into what's happening in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where we see the very worst atrocities committed against women, unbearable atrocities. But this is the world that we are called forth to be leaders at, for. So this has gotten so out of hand that I don't know what's happened with the US Congress. This was a lovely act. I haven't checked whether they passed it, but since they didn't pass the Fair Wage for Women Act in the United States last week, I doubt that they're going to do anything with this. But at least it showed that this has become such an issue that some members of the US Congress uh, are saying we will not give aid to countries where women are the object of violence. That would be a great thing. So the world's three biggest industries, do you know what they are? War. Well, war, that comes third. Drugs is first. I've heard different ways of placing these. This is the really scary one. Humic trafficking is second, and armaments, weapons is third. Someone told me that, uh, no, weapons are first. But the one I want to point out is, is human trafficking. This has occurred under our watch. Now, the good story is that women are rising up. Women everywhere, independent of their circumstances, are saying, no more of this. No more of this. You may have seen these posters. They're starting to appear everywhere. I am powerful is the statement. Women, the world's largest untapped natural resource. 
says over there, she has the power to change her world. You have the power to help her do it. This is the good news story of women in the world. The uh, United Nations and many other agencies have noticed that when women, this is quite well validated now, that when women achieve economic means, everyone benefits. So that community health improves because the women are caring and they're careful. They start to notice what could be improved when they have money to fix it. That's where the money goes. When we are leaders, we worry about the children. We care about what happens in the future. And we don't think only of ourselves. So we've got a lot of work to do here. And the question that's out in the general culture is, where have all the leaders gone? Well, when we're asking this question, we're looking in the wrong place. We're looking for this guy, right? <laughs> One of my uh, friends said, you know, the good thing about this form of leadership is he's unarmed. <laughs> okay? What's really interesting, this is a 16th century statue, Adrian de Vries. And it has a big political commentary. This is a human leg, human torso. So he's saying something about how this form of leadership is upheld on the backs of the slaves or the peasants. Now, it has led us in uh, Burkana to realize that we, this is the definition of leader that we're proposing around the world. A leader is anyone willing to help. It's not a role, it's an action. And it's an action of the heart. When you see something that needs to be fixed, you step forward and in that moment you become a leader. So we're going to spend some time on this question in a little bit, but I want to focus your attention on it right now. The things we might need to walk out of are circumstances, whatever they are. Could be a job, could be a relationship that impede us, that keep us from being all we can be. We might also need to walk out of a limiting belief about ourselves such as well, I can't really do anything. And I'm going to specifically ask us to walk out right now on this idea of how the world changes. Because we really need to understand this so that we can answer this question. Okay, what is our role in creating change in the world? I would like us to walk out of the following idea, and it's this. Okay? Let's just get rid of this once and for all. Right? Thank you. This is how change happens. This was a true org chart drawn by a Catholic sister who sat on top of a very large healthcare system. And she called this a simplified example <laughs> of collaboration and competition. But this is the only form of organization used on this planet. The only form used by however many billions of species there are and the only form used by human beings even when you're inside a hierarchy. It's the network of relationships that saves you, that gives you information, that friends who help you, people you trust. It never, never is true that hierarchy is the way to organize anything. And again, just as Chief Leah was saying, you know, it's not about the individual, it's about the collective. Well, another way of saying that is it's about the network. It's about our interdependent relationships. 
In fact, it's the only thing that ever does. Uh, what I have noticed in my own studies of how change efforts begin, no matter how big they get, they start with simple conversations among friends. How do you go from two surviving trees to 30 million? How is that possible? This is only possible because we live in a network of relationships. And when something is meaningful, it spreads through our network of relationships. So here's how I think it works. Actually, I'm convinced that it works. That was too humble a statement. Here's how it works, folks. <laughs> <laughs> you can start anywhere. You can start w with whatever intrigues you or gets your attention or where you just say that has to stop. It could be your child's uh, school. It could be a pothole outside your house. It could be too much litter in your neighborhood. It could be Darfur. It could be anything, but it got your attention. And because you're in a network, you just start there. And then you follow it wherever it leads you. I have a caption for this photo, which is that this is 80,000 pounds of blubber believing it can fly. <laughs> so, Martin Luther King said that our lives begin to end the day we remain silent about something we care about. We lose our vitality, we lose our energy, we lose our imagination when we do not speak up or step forward about something we care about. So this is an important view to walk out of, the view that the world will change without us if we just elect the right officials, the view that a problem will be solved if I just call someone in the right office. None of this is going to change the world. The only thing that's going to change the world is us. So fortunately, I will now give you the four steps for changing the world. <laughs> okay. So you notice what is getting your attention. You get started. You learn as you go and you pay attention to how well we're relating in, those, in these processes. And maybe there'll be Nobel Peace Prizes awarded in Vancouver, maybe. But this is actually the biggest idea I want us to embrace and to realize that there is no change that's going to happen without us. So in this way, the future of the world really does, does depend, not on women as some category, but on us as caring, decent, thoughtful, thinking about the future. I think what sustains women in these very dire circumstances is love. It's just, you know, you don't feel like you have a choice as a mother for the children, as a member of a community. I mean, I see this all over the world. I'm seeing it now, especially with the women of New Orleans who have persevered over two and a half years now under excruciatingly bad circumstances to bring their communities back, to create new futures for their children and for their communities. So this quality of resilience, I can't explain any other way except that it's love manifesting itself. What I witness here tonight um, in this gathering, this is, I don't know what number on the tour, um, but it is right up there. There's, this tour has been going across North America. We heard tonight that Toronto, which had just happened, was sold out. Vancouver was sold out. There was a phenomenal response by the women of Vancouver to this call, to, to the call for women's leadership, um, the revival of women's leadership, the coming forward of our 
type of collaborative uh, leadership, the bringing forward of a different view and way of leading. Um, women were extremely excited and interested to hear about the difference that uh, we make when we show up. And um, there's a palpable excitement about being here tonight, about hearing um, Meg speak about a different way of changing the world, which isn't about hierarchy and organizational charts. It's about networks and relationships. It's about coming from what we care about, turning to one another, telling a small group of people, and following the energy of yes. The intention of our Women's Leadership Revival here was really to invite women into the gift of their leadership and to celebrate women's leadership as well as invite us fearlessly to offer that gift of our leadership to the world. And the room was rocking. <laughs> I think we just took the lid off of that. And I just want, can't wait to see what happens with the women of Vancouver, as well as we're just really clear how connected we are to a global movement around women's leadership. And it feels like Vancouver's even more woven in now. The leaders that we need are already here. And a leader is anyone who wants to help, just really inviting forth the community into their leadership. Another is that we really have to be creating and living the futures that we want now. And that we do this deeply in our own local work, but we're also in learning relationship um, with others in our region and around the world. And that message um, for how we really bring about social innovation and change is resounding very loudly and clearly now on the planet. So I think we are both in a really strong, beautiful place, and it's time. My message to women everywhere, but it's not just to women, it's also to men, is the Kofi Annan quote, the future of the world depends on women. It depends on us stepping forward with our leadership, not being afraid, even though we come from cultures or places that have told us we're worthless, we're meaningless, or we can't do that. So we as women really have to step past all the stereotypes and cultural hindrances that have kept us back for centuries and centuries and really understand that the future of the world depends on us. The health of our children, the health of our communities depends on women stepping forward. And also the health of the human species depends on everyone, men and women, realizing that if we don't start paying attention to the plight of women worldwide, to the terrible abuse that's going on with war and rape and poverty and illiteracy that mostly affects women and therefore the children. If we don't get smart and start to notice what's happening, we're actually destroying ourselves. So the future of the world does depend on women and it does depend on men and women noticing what's happening to the children and to their mothers and really taking action.